So I'm going to read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the following away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to whom he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, in every good word and work. In this chapter, we see that the Apostle Paul is foretelling of a man of sin, a man of lawlessness who would rise up in the temple of God and would take away his church into a falling away, into apostasy, into false doctrine. Now, concerning what this means, it says that there would be a time, there's something that is withholding him now from coming to power. There's something withholding him. Back in the time of the Apostle Paul, if we look at the early church fathers, I could actually quote to you many, many passages from the early church fathers concerning what they had to say, but I won't have time, so I'll only read two examples. Jerome says, we should therefore concur with the traditional interpretation of the Christian church. Note that. Tradi traditional interpretation of the Christian church, meaning there was a pretty wide consensus back then. He says that at the end of the world, when the Roman Empire is to be destroyed, there will be ten kings who will partition the Roman world among themselves. Then an insignificant eleventh king will arise who will overcome the ten kings. That's Jerome's commentary on Daniel 7, verse 8. Augustine says, It is not absurd to believe that the words of the apostle, only he who now holdeth 
let him hold until he be taken out of the way, refer to the Roman Empire. As if it were said, only he who now reigneth, let him reign until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed. No one doubts that this means Antichrist. So when you look at history, what actually happened is as soon as the Roman Empire fell, you begin to see the rise of the papacy. In Rome, the Bishop of Rome wanted to take upon himself authority which he never had before. But even before that rise of the papacy, the, the rise of the Bishop of Rome to this position that he has now, before it was fully manifested, um, what the Bishop of Rome back then, who is now known as Gregory the Great, said, anyone who desires to be called, anyone who calls himself or desires to be called the Bishop of Bishops is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist because he proudly puts himself above all others. Now, guess who calls himself that today? In fact, much later, many, many centuries later, Pope Pius IX says, it is therefore by a particular decree of divine providence that at the fall of the Roman Empire and its partition into separate kingdoms, the Roman pontiff, that is the Pope, whom Christ made the head and center of his entire church, that's his claim, so he says, acquired civil power. And then he goes on, Certainly it was by a most wise design of God himself that in the midst of so great a multitude and variety of temporal princes, the sovereign pontiff enjoyed political liberty, which is so necessary for him to exercise his spiritual power, his authority, and his jurisdiction over the whole world. You see what kind of claims those are. Now, how did this really happen? Well, it didn't happen overnight. You see, from the time of the Roman Empire to the late Middle Ages, there was a lot of things that happened. For example, for example, a, ser a series of writings known as, known as the pseudo Isidorian Decretals, which were in fact forgeries written in the name of the church father, the early church fathers, to support this idea of the papacy, the Pope of Rome over and above all other bishops and pastors. And no one actually knew that these were forgeries until about the time of the Protestant Reformation. And then, but not only that, we see with it a ro the, the rise of false doctrines. Doctrines like purgatory, which were not popular until, were not really fully formalized until the 12th century. The doctrine of transubstantiation and other things that came about. And not only that, but we see also a great deal of unrighteousness within the very office of the papacy. For example, there was a time in history where the Pope meddled with prostitutes so much that it, that period has come to be known as the pornocracy. And so, over time, what happened is with the introduction of new doctrines that compromise the gospel, and with the rise of this man of lawlessness, this man of sin, who exalts himself in the church. Now you might wonder, well it says it's in the temple, yes. What is a temple of God? It's the church, right? The temple in Jerusalem after the fall of the Roman Empire is long gone. It's already destroyed. 
He can't be talking about the physical temple. And so this man of lawlessness raises himself up in the church and tries to take authority over the, over the whole church and basically just tries to take the place of God. Now some of you might say, well, the Pope doesn't claim to be God. But if you read carefully what it says in the text, that's not really what it's saying the man of lawlessness is going to do. It only says that he's going to display himself as being God. And if you think about it for a few moments, what does the Pope call himself? He calls himself the head of the church. In Scripture, there's only one person who's the head of the church, and that's Jesus Christ. He calls himself the Holy Father. In Scripture, there's only one who's called the Holy Father, and that is God the Father. He calls himself the Vicar of Christ, that is the representative of Christ. But in Scripture, that's the Holy Spirit. And you see, he's taken and usurped the roles and the titles that only God can apply to himself. Only God can take. Only, only apply to God. And not only that, but actually claimed, claimed for a long time that no one can be saved outside of submission to the Pope. For example, Pope Innocent III, who was, by the way, not so innocent, says he, he was in the, from 1198 to 1216, he was the Pope. He says, we may, according to the fullness of our power, dispose of the law, dispense above the law. Those whom the Pope of Rome doth separate, it is not a man that separates them, but God. For the Pope holdeth the place on earth not simply of a man, but of the true God. And you see, there were some popes who actually did make some rather notorious claims. And then Pope Clement VI says, uh, he was Pope from 1342 to 1352. He says, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church, which he understood to be whatever the Pope dictates, of course, all who raise themselves against the faith of the Roman Church and die in final impenitence have been damned and gone to hell. Now you have to understand, back in those days, people were actually, they actually believed this. They actually thought that to die outside of the favor of the Pope was to be damned for all eternity. Even kings and queens feared the Pope. On one occasion, a monarch shivering in the snow outside the papal palace to beg forgiveness to the Pope for po a political issue. That's what it was like back then. And in addition to this, you had the Pope actively persecuting any dissenting movements. There were actually movements to try to reform the church, to try to get it away from this papal uh, whore crap, is what I call it. And they were persecuted. Groups like the Hussites, the, Walden the Waldensians, John Wycliffe, who was actually, they weren't able to kill him, but they dug up his bones and then burned them to ashes and then threw them in the river. And a lot of them, a lot of these people who joining these movements to try to stay faithful to the Bible, who opposed the, who were, who refused to bow to the tyranny of the Pope, were put to death in many cruel ways. Some burned alive at the stake, others buried alive, others thrown off of the edge of the cliff, mother and child, 
infants, elderly, anyone who refused to bow to the false doctrines of the Pope. In addition to that, you had a, you had a full-scale uh, persecution against the true believers who wanted to follow the Bible. You also had great diseases like what later came to be known as the Black Plague, which wiped out a third of the population of Europe. You want to compare that to our corona disease, coronavirus? We have a 99% chance of surviving. One third of the population of Europe wiped out by a plague. And in addition to this, you had, I mean, there were so many things, I won't have time to go into all that was going on, but basically, towards the late Middle Ages, you know, from speaking, especially the 12th century to onwards, basically, uh, you had basically almost a complete forgetfulness of the gospel among the mainstream people. I mean, except for the pre-Reformation movements that I talked about. And that made it possible for, the, for what it was called the sale of indulgences. Now some of you might not know what in the world is an indulgence. Well, an indulgence was a letter which basically said that if you buy this letter of indulgence, you would have your sins forgiven, and you would not have to spend time in purgatory. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, what in the world is purgatory? Well, that's another doctrine that was invented in the late Middle Ages. Uh, like I mentioned, in, in the 12th century, basically. And that was a place where the people who were not so bad to be, be sent directly to hell and maybe not so good to go directly to heaven but they had certain sins to make up for and so they had to be punished in purgatory before they could enter heaven and so what would happen is uh, these sellers of indulgences would come into places like Germany especially and you know they would basically sell these to people saying you buy this indulgence and you could buy it for your family members who might be in purgatory and for yourself and all the sins you've committed from now in the past until now can be forgiven if you give your money to help build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome which is where the Pope which is that big building where the Pope now you know, in, in, in Rome, where the Pope is. And so they used to say, as soon as the money in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. That was their selling line. And so, this is what brought about the Protestant Reformation. Because Martin Luther saw this happening he saw this corruption going on and he was infuriated. To use modern terminology, he was pissed off. And so he wrote something called the 95 Theses, also known as the Treatise on Indulgences. And then he nailed it to the church door in Wittenberg or at least we think that's what he did, if not somebody nailed it there for him. But we know that it was published on October 31st, 1517. So I'm going to read to you a few examples of these theses, these, five, these 95 basically debate statements. Because that's what Luther was trying to do, is start a debate in the university. He had become a professor in the university. So I'll read you a few examples. He says, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, 
He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. And they preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clings into the money chest, the, f the soul flies out of purgatory. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Any true Christian, whether living or dead, participates in all the blessings of Christ and the Church, and this is granted him by God even without indulgence letters. Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy to the need he does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. Christians are to be taught that he who sees a needy man and passes him by, yet gives his money for indulgences, does not buy papal indulgences, but God's wrath. The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. To say that the cross emblazoned with the papal coat of arms and set up by the indulgence preachers is equal in worth to the cross of Christ is blasphemy. Again, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money rather than with the money of poor believers? Away with them, with all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, Peace, peace, and there is no peace. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, Cross, cross, but there is no cross. And you see Martin Luther's words. They were fighting words. And we need more of that today. We have been lied to basically, by so much of what passes as Christianity, into thinking that the good men are the people who are nice. No. The good men, the good people, are, are, are people who are dangerous to the kingdom of Satan. You see, Jesus, he was, the reason they crucified him is because he was dangerous. He was dangerous to the established authorities. He was becoming too popular. He was stealing the fame and popularity from the Pharisees. He could start a movement that would be known worldwide. He could become the king. And so both the Jews and the Romans got together to crucify him. And that's what Martin Luther was like. He was dangerous. He wasn't afraid to speak the hard truth, even when it was unpopular. And so, what happened? You see, this is why this was so revolutionary, because soon after writing these 95 theses, Martin Luther basically came to a full understanding of the Gospel, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. It's not by all these works and all these merits that you try to earn God's favor. That Christ died on the cross so that he might justify the wicked through faith. His righteousness being imputed to them and their sins being imputed to him and he, him dying on the cross in their place. Therefore all their sins are forgiven and wiped out. And if this is true, if this is true, then the whole basis, the whole foundation for the Pope's money line of indulgences is shattered, it's fallen apart. And so, after Martin Luther came some others like John Calvin, John Calvin, who was from France, actually had to run away from his home country, never to see it again, because he began preaching the gospel, just like the other reformers. 
In fact, just before John Calvin, there was also Zwingli and many others, like John Knox and many others who I, I just don't have time to mention. And these people, for example, Martin Luther, I mean, this is what kind of boldness they had. When the Black Plague came to their cities, Martin, both Martin Luther and John Calvin decided to stay to minister to those who were perishing in the hour of death. It was dangerous. Very dangerous. A lot more dangerous than this our current situation. This is laughable in comparison. What cowards we've become. And then, it was soon after they just rediscovered the gospel by the reading of scripture that basically all the reformers unanimously agreed that the Pope is the Antichrist foretold in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In a, a papal bull called Unam, Unam Sanctum, it actually says, Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Want to know what Martin Luther said in response to that kind of thing? In a small called Articles, Part 2, Article 4 on the papacy, Martin Luther says, This teaching shows forcefully that the Pope is the very Antichrist who has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which nevertheless is nothing and is neither ordained nor commanded by God. He also says that this teaching, that no one can be saved apart from the Pope, amounts to nothing less than saying that although you believe in Christ and have in Him alone everything that is necessary to salvation, yet it is nothing and all in vain unless you regard and have and worship Me as your God and be subjected and be subjected and obedient to Me. That's really what the Pope is saying. Or was saying back in those days, at least. In the Westminster Confession, which is actually exactly the same as the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 35 for the Western Westminster Confession, it says, There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, And so, you think the Pope has stopped calling, uh, making such bold claims. He hasn't. 1922 to 1939, Pope Pius XI was the Pope, and he said this, You know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on the earth, the Vicar of Christ, which means... I am God on the earth. And even one of the more well-respected popes, Pope John Paul II, said this, God created man as rational and free, thereby, thereby placing himself under man's judgment. The history of salvation is also the history of man's continual judgment of God, not only of man's questions and doubts, but of his actual judgment of God. That's in Crossing the Threshold of Pope, quoted in a book called Pope John Paul II, in my own words. And then, finally, our current Pope. If it is not already clear that this is the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, who introduces false doctrines to the church. Well, lately, just this last week actually, Pope Francis 
says, he said this, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. What we have to have is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. That's the Pope endorsing what the Bible explicitly condemns. So brothers and sisters, it took many, many lives to be sacrificed. It took much courage to overcome this tyranny of the Pope in the Middle Ages and to give us the Protestant Reformation and to put to death the inquisitions of the Middle Ages. But today, we actually live in no different a situation. The darkness has returned, but in a different form. The Pope is still Purdue, Purdue. he's full along with the secular worldview, as I have just read to you. And there's plenty, in fact, the, the, the things that are going on now in politics, they go a lot deeper than many of us can imagine. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. What we need is men who are courageous, men who are willing to obey God even in the midst of fear, who are willing to call upon His grace to help them through it, who are willing to be dangerous even if it costs them their lives. The Church of the Reformation period makes us all look like cowards in comparison. We're so afraid of something we have a very high likely chance of surviving. Well, they, in, in one instance, for example, you know, there were, you know, they had the, the basically the the army that the Pope sent, basically, and they would put gunpowder into the noses or the ears of believers and blow them apart, sometimes into the wombs of pregnant mothers, blown to pieces. What has happened? Where are the Protestants today? But I can give you a, a late example. In fact, Reformation Day is special to us as a family and I think as a church because this is the day when our beloved uncle, Tikashu, also died, breathed his last breath. All his life, before he was a Christian, as an unbeliever, drank himself almost to death. Fits of rage destroyed people's houses, bamboo huts, until one day God changed his heart and he believed and gave the rest of his life to proclaim the gospel to his people in Karen State, even when in the midst of war. And there was one time he was going to go to a wedding there. And we were hearing that some people got killed in those villages. We told him, we're, we're fear for your safety. He said, I have to go anyways. That's the kind of courage we need. And on this day, a few years ago, one of the young men whom he was trying to train up was at his sick bed. And he told him, I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to work with you for the gospel anymore. And he turned aside, a tear fell down his face. And that was it. That was his last breath. But people like that will rise again because we believe in the resurrection of the dead. Jesus said not to fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. 
him. We have a situation before us where thousands upon thousands, actually millions of the weakest among us, little babies, are being murdered in their mother's wombs. And the silence of the church is cowardice. You want to know how you can know that you would not have been one of the people who just went along with Hitler? Well, just look at yourself today. Are you speaking out against the injustices of our day? Because if you're not, then you would have been just as cowardly as they were. And so, my call today is a call to rise above the fear of man, the fear of disease, the fear of death. After all, we believe the gospel, do we not? We believe that we have eternal life because of Christ's sacrifice. Lay down the fear. Away with the cowardice. Take up the sword of truth and go stab the kingdom of darkness in the heart. No matter what happens to you. 